Thank you, Carl. Here we go. Good morning, everybody. It's really wonderful to have you all joining us on our first ever online service. It is, uh, I know it's difficult under these conditions, but we are so thankful that we have the technology that we have today and we can gather together um, in spirit at least and worship the Lord. So we're going to begin our time of worship together now. Let's uh, come to God in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that you're always good. I thank you, God, for your provision. I thank you, Lord, for your protection. And I pray, Father God, that you would be with us this day. And I, I Father, I pray for your peace and I pray for your Holy Spirit to rest upon us as we come together and as we worship you, Lord, and to be with each person uh, who, who is a part of this service that maybe is sitting in the comfort of their own home or maybe will be listening to this while driving in their vehicle or wherever they are, Lord, just that your spirit would reach out to them, Lord, and that you would touch them, Father. We pray most of all that our worship together, that it would be honoring to you, that it would be worship that ministers to you, God. So we just invite you, and we invite your spirit to come and, and to be with us, Lord, and for you to speak to us, God. And I pray that every heart would be lifted, Lord, and that you would strengthen any hands that are feeble, God, and that you would just fill us up today. We look to you to be our source of strength and our source of joy. We want to thank you most of all that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, who took the punishment that we deserve for our sins. We want to lift up the mighty name of Jesus in this place. We thank you that he is risen and that he rose again some three days later, that death could not hold him. And we want to give you all the glory for this wonderful gospel and this plan of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that we have been purchased, that we have been redeemed. We want to celebrate that this morning. We want to worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus 
have mercy on me, the son of David, I want to see, son of David, have mercy, Thank you.
Amen. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, that in the midst of our trouble, Lord, in the midst of um, sometimes brokenness in our lives and all of the various things, all the various storms of life that we experience, that you are always there, that your mercy is real and it is new every morning. We thank you, Father God, for your hand that reaches out to seek and save the lost. We thank you, Lord God, for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Lord, we just praise you. We honor you. We thank you, God, that there is no problem that's too big for you. There is no circumstance, God, where you cannot uphold your people. And we thank you, Lord, for being our source of strength. We thank you, God, that in our weakness, your power shows up and, and you are strong in us. We thank you, Father God, for that. I pray, Lord, as we, as we look to your word, that you would open our eyes to it, God, that you would incline our ears to hear your truth and that your Holy Spirit would speak from this book that you have supernaturally preserved for us and that you would teach us and instruct us in the way of righteousness and equip us, Father, for the work that lies ahead. That it would, that it would create change and transformation in our personal lives. And we thank you, God, for it. We thank you, Lord. We look to you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can get your Bibles out and turn to Luke chapter 6. So I recognize that this is probably going to be a little bit of a different experience for all of us. It certainly is for me. Um, the good news is that if I preach too long, you can always just pause it and then hit play again at your convenience. So that's, that's definitely, that's definitely going to be a positive there's no one here to laugh at my bad jokes, so that's kind of making me sad. And I certainly do miss everybody, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, so, it's such a strange feeling to not have uh, so many people around on Sunday mornings. You know, our church fellowship is so special and it's so important. But we are adapting uh, to the times that we live in today, and I want to encourage everyone to stay in communication with your church family. And you might have to be a little bit more intentional about that right now uh, with the closure of so many church events. And obviously, we need to be in prayer um, about the situation, about the coronavirus. We want to be praying for our uh, nation's leaders and uh, government officials and, and uh, so many people that are involved in such important decisions. And don't also forget to pray for your church leaders because we have a lot of difficult decisions to make too in regard to this stuff. And on the one hand, we certainly don't want to put um, anyone at risk. And on the other hand, we don't want to uh, forsake the gathering of the assembly together. So it's a lot to weigh out. Uh, here's, you guys know where we are for now and there'll be more updates on our Facebook page and this will give us the opportunity to um, with our SoundCloud, and, and, and we'll probably upload videos on, on YouTube and Facebook. And it'll be a great opportunity while everybody's cooped up to um, share it, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and share these videos and share these messages. Scripture tells us that we should make the most of every opportunity. And so we certainly want to do that. And this is an opportunity, make no mistake about it. So let's do that. People are looking for the peace of God. They're looking for a comfort. They're looking for a refuge. And we know what the answer is, and it is in Jesus Christ. So without any further ado, let's jump into the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 27. With uh, We're going verse by verse through the book of Luke. And, and as I mentioned earlier, but if you have missed any of our messages, you can go to our SoundCloud page, and we have all of our messages archived there. Just look up the Bride Church on SoundCloud. 
and, uh, and they'll all be available to you. But we've been going through this just verse by verse, and, you know, there are no accidents in the kingdom of God. God does not make um, mistakes, and so many times as we go through verse-by-verse verse teachings where you really, you know, it's difficult to plan out six, nine months in advance and so on. And so we're, we're plowing through the scriptures and we're learning things and we're taking our time and, and going through and, and really getting into the details of, of the gospel of Luke. And I feel like today's passage is actually quite applicable for the times that we're living in today. And it starts off in verse 27. It says this, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. One of the things that I think is important for us to remember as we begin to get into this section um, in the Gospel of Luke is, is there is some context here that's really important. And if you were to back up to verse 22, where it's sort of going through Luke's version of the Beatitudes, like is found in Matthew, Verse 22 says, blessed are you when men hate you. It sounds like a good time. Sounds like fun. Um, probably not. And then it says, and when they exclude you. None of us really like that either. And revile you and cast you out as evil. And so you go, all of these horrible things is kind of depicting various types of persecution that we may go through. And then it says something very important. It says, for the son of man's sake. In other words, this persecution that's being addressed and this mistreatment that, that's going to be talked about throughout this chapter is in the context of because you bear the name of Christ, because you call yourself a Christian, because you say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I am committed to living for him, then there is all of a the sudden these this hatred that, that comes out, this exclusion of you and reviling and, and people speaking evil and always looking for you to, to suddenly trip up. And Jesus says, you're blessed if you undergo those kinds of things. Um, in other words, you should expect it. He told his disciples, don't be surprised if the world hates you. They hated me first. So it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that, to understand why it could be a, a, bless, a blessed thing. And, and to be blessed simply means to have joy, and I believe a, a lasting joy. And so Jesus tells us we're going to have joy because of the persecution that we, they don't seem to go together, but in the kingdom of God they do, amen? They do. So that is the context of the passage. It's all in the context for Christ's sake, because you bear the name of Christ, you can be blessed for these things. And, and I really do believe that's the context into the verses moving forward. So when he says, do you love your enemies? First of all, ask yourself the question, why are they your enemies? Who are we talking about? And, and one of the things that Paul talks about also is people who are enemies to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says, if you're not for me, you're against me. So we have to understand that there are a lot of enemies. In fact, the book of Romans teaches us that we were once enemies of God prior to coming to faith in Christ. Um, maybe that didn't mean that we were out uh, burning Bibles or something, but in the eyes of God, we were at odds with him. We were enemies. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is he's brought us into right relationship through Jesus Christ, the Son. And so now it says, love your enemies. Well, why? Well, you were once an enemy. And God loved you and has brought you into his family. So you need to love your enemies. You need to do good to those who hate you. Why do they hate you? The context, again, is they hate you because of who you are in Christ. They hate you because of your identity. That is the context. If, if you think this applies, um, all of these things apply as we're going to read through this. People hate you, say, because, you know, you're a jerk to everyone and, and, and you're mean to people and, and you're not considerate and you're super selfish, then these blessings do not apply to you. This is in the context of things that we suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ, not for the sake of, you know, being a jerk or something like that. So verse 29 says, this is a very famous 
uh, very famous verse, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Again, I want us to understand the context of this is these things are happening for the sake of Christ. Now, I do not believe, because I think there's a lot of confusion about this passage, and I want to be really clear, and I think, I think people really do have a difficult time with the whole turn the other cheek thing. And often I believe it's taken out of context, and I do not believe that this is a call to be a welcome mat, or it's a call to be a victim, or even to sort of defiantly absorb punishment. I've heard people explain it that way. I think this is really about being a witness to everyone around us, including the people who may be persecuting you, to be a witness to those around you in the face of personal persecution for Christ's sake, because of your faith, because of your faith. Now, oftentimes, our, our initial reaction to someone attacking us, our flesh reaction is bite back. You know, somebody attacks you, um, your flesh, your, your, you know, your old you would, would want to then attack them. Um, you would want to respond in some kind of way to, uh, you, somebody hurts you, that you're going to hurt them. You're going to be defensive. You're going to be aggressive, and so on. Uh, this is not a call to that. I, I believe that at the heart of this passage, what we're saying is that our witness and our testimony to those around us is more important than someone insulting us. Uh, sometimes we'll even say in our culture, that was a real slap in the face. And, and we say it metaphorically about, uh, you know, something someone says to you that's offensive. You know, that was insulting. Wow, that was a smack in the face. That was a slap in the face. And I, I see that concept here. That, yeah, literally, there could, there could literally be a situation like this where somebody too insults you or, or, or to, as a form of persecution because of your faith decides they're going to smack you on the face. And then it says, you know, it, it's almost like you're saying, Hey, I'm okay with suffering persecution for Christ's sake. I, I'm okay. I'm okay if it's for Christ's sake, then it makes sense. Where it doesn't make sense is if it causes you to be like a total pacifist that will never, you know, fight back in any scenario or situation. And I don't believe that that is what the scripture is calling us to here. But oftentimes when we do not respond by fighting back, screaming and yelling, but rather respond with compassion, it creates conviction and gives pause to the person who is inflicting the harm. It allows the Holy Spirit to work through us. And I, I think that's so important for us to understand the heart of God in the passage is not that you receive more damage or, or something like that, but the heart of God is to be a witness to those around you. And so this is just really, really important stuff. Verse 30 says, To give, give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Again, we have another really famous verse here. We have like the golden rule, um, as you want other people to do, to do to them. If you are in a position to help others in need, you should do it. You should do it. In the time that we live in right now and, and with the threat of this virus and we don't know how impactful this is going to be, it's already been fairly impactful and it may just be getting started, there will probably be opportunities to help other people. And if we have those opportunities, scripturally speaking, we should do it. We need to be wise about that, but we should do it. And if somebody asks for your help, and you're able to help them, then you should do it. And that, that's what the scripture is saying. 
and uh, from him who takes away your goods and, you know, do not ask for them back. In other words, if you have enough, if you're able to do this, then you, sh then you should do it. You should do it and, and consider it like, a, like something of an offering to God, an offering of obedience to God. And then, and then again it says, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do likewise to them. Perhaps you can remember times when others have done the same for you. When you were in a time of need or maybe even a time of desperation and people stepped in and it helped you in just a tremendous kind of way. That's what comes to mind when I think about this verse. I've seen the people of God do this. I've had this happen in my own life. I've seen it happen in many others' lives where someone is going through a difficult season. Somebody's going through, um, they're, they're suffering or their family is suffering. And people step in and they just give. And they give of their time. And, and they give of their energy. And they give of their resources. And it's such a massive and incredible blessing. And in fact, Scripture teaches us that's, that, again, this is a testimony to the world around us. Scripture tells us that we should do good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. And, and I think that's absolutely true. I think we need to be considerate of one another, especially your church family in this season. And even in light of this recent coronavirus outbreak, we should, we should be considerate and be thoughtful. Don't just go into some kind of weird isolation mode where you're only thinking about yourself or maybe your immediate family and it's like everybody else stay away. You know, I have to hoard all my toilet paper and make sure that no one comes in and, and, and steals them, you know. Guard the toilet paper with your life. Um, let's not be that uh, introverted in this season. Um, let's look out for the needs of others and, and, and see... And, and I know, you know, some of the things to consider. Consider making that phone call when God puts that person on your mind to call and, and, and to check up on somebody. Um, maybe those of you that are elderly or uh, are infirm, you know, that you know may, might not be the safest time for that. Maybe you can, if you're healthy and you're well, or, you know, maybe you can go and do something for them. Maybe you can make that run for them, maybe you, uh, to the store or what have you, uh, to try and help them in what could be sort of a scary time for them. And I think if we're sensitive to the needs of others, there's going to be a whole host of opportunities to give and to serve and to help others and to be that encouragement and to be that support during this time. So I think that's super important, and I definitely think that's something you could consider, and I don't think that it's reaching to apply that from this verse. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. If you were in their shoes, if you were in somebody's shoes that at this point in time would be at risk, at this point in time, someone who might feel vulnerable how would you feel? And it's a perspective thing. And so we need to consider that perspective. Always try to put the shoe on the other foot. Always consider what it would be like to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. And if we do that, it's going to make us a lot more conscientious and a lot more sensitive to the needs that are going to, we're going to see a lot more opportunities. And we can allow God to lead us and to speak us in that way and really do a great amount of good for the kingdom of God. Verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Okay, again now, we're looking at outsiders. We're looking at people that yeah, maybe aren't your favorite people. We'll put it that way. Maybe they're not your favorites. And it says that, well, if you just love those who love you, and this could be us, you know, getting selfish in this season. This could be us, again, being introverted, looking only at our, our, ourselves and our own, like, immediate little circle of people, and not being considerate of all to the needs of other people around us in our community. It's almost taken for granted that you're going to love those who love you in this passage. Like, that's easy. Anybody can do that. Heck, even the world does that, Jesus says. Even the world does that. It's not impressive, okay, to love those who love you. But to start to do good to those 
who maybe don't like you. See, this is where the real witness is. This is where the real supernatural love can begin to shine through. And as Christians and as the church, this is how we need to be. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours and this kind of mentality. And this whole passage seems to be steering us into this direction where you're able to do good deeds and expect absolutely nothing in return. It's not about that. It's about doing it out of obedience for God. It's about doing it in a way that's pleasing to him, that's worship to God, that's service to God. And it's not about what I can get back. And so it goes on in verse 34. It says, and if you lend to those from whom you have received back, from whom, excuse me, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Wow. Okay. This particular part, I, I think this is particularly important in regard to those who are less fortunate than yourself in some way or another. Doesn't have to be applied that way. That's just where my mind goes when I read this passage, okay? Because you're lending to someone. They need something that you have. So that would say you're in some way more fortunate than they are, okay? Love your enemies, lend, hoping for nothing in return, for your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. This is something that's honoring to God. This is something that God honors his, his uh, servants for doing. And it says then that he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. And for some reason, that resonates in my bones. And maybe that is because I've had the privilege of serving in a whole bunch of different ministries from addiction recovery ministries to more humanitarian type ministries like when we did the clothing ministry in the old building or when we made laundry soap or we've been a host site for the uh, men's homeless shelter. We've done it for the women's. We've done community outreach to the youth in downtown Michigan City. We've done a lot of things. And once you've done good and you've seen that uh, not everybody's thankful for it, let's just put it that way. Not everybody responds the way that you think they're going to respond when you go to try and help them out. But it reminds us to be merciful just as your father also is merciful. So having said that, I think one of the great shocks people experience is when they begin to meet tangible needs. Some people put an extremely high emphasis on meeting tangible needs in the communities and so on. And indeed, that's important. And indeed, there are plenty of scriptural verses that would encourage us in that direction so long as it's not at the expense of their soul, the people that you're helping, okay? Because the greatest miracle that God ever does is when he takes somebody who is dead spiritually and is an enemy of God and he brings them in and adopts them as children and makes them alive in Christ Jesus. That's the greatest miracle that God does here in the world today. So if I serve at the soup kitchen, if I give clothes to those that are in need, if we do all of these kinds of things and we don't do it and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're only meeting temporary needs and, and we're ignoring the fact that they are in a burning building that is on fire. And, and we're just pretending like it's okay. Well, here, here's some supplies. Here, let me give you a bottle of water. That should help you. No, you're in a burning house. It's on fire. And, and Jesus is the only way out. Okay? He is the only way to salvation. And we cannot ever neglect that fact uh, for the purpose of simply humanitarian causes. Now, should we do those causes? Yes, we should. Do we? Absolutely. Should we be sensitive to those things in times of need? Yes, absolutely. But never at the extent of, of uh, marginalizing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That should never happen. 
And in fact, the whole purpose of meeting these tangible needs is to be a good witness to create space for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how it's supposed to work. But it says that God is kind. He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Now, at some point in time in your life, you have been unthankful for the grace of God. You have been unthankful for his provision. And maybe you are today. Uh, maybe you're bummed out about everything that's going on and you're forgetting to be thankful for all that God has done in your life and all that God has blessed you with. Maybe you're upset because your plans have been messed up for the future. And you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you're unthankful because so much has changed in so little time. I think it's important for us to remember the mercy of God, how much we need it, to remember the goodness of God, to look to God to be our refuge, to be our source of strength in a time of need, and, and to give us wisdom. Boy, do we need that. We need wisdom. Again, getting back to this idea that people don't always respond the way that we think they're going to respond. You guys will remember this passage in Matthew 25. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But Jesus starts it off saying, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, and he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep, from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I'm going to pause there for just a second. This passage seems to be pretty clear. It's about meeting tangible needs, meeting physical needs. I want you to keep in mind, I really want you to keep in mind, one of the Pharisees had asked Jesus who their neighbor is and so on, and he gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. I want you to just think about that. God wants us to love people who are outside of our circle, outside of our sphere, and if we can help, if we can, if we can do things, if you see a need, you, you're never going to be able to meet all the needs, but if you can see a need and there's something you, sh you should pray about it, you should do it. You may not even have to pray about it. Maybe you should just do it. Just step out and do it. But I think the fact that he says, the least of these, my brethren, and who does Jesus consider his brethren? And I'm going to have to say, first and foremost, we've been adopted into the family of God. To as many as received him, received Christ, to them he gave the right to be called sons of God or children of God. Okay? And we become co-heirs with Christ. And we become a part of his spiritual family. And I, I think the greatest context of this, not that I don't think it's true for other people, not that I don't think it's true for outsides, but it's to be sensitive to the needs of your brothers and sisters in the faith, first and foremost, and to consider that. And again, if you look at this passage in the context of persecution and suffering that was caused, that the, the, the very words of this passage in Matthew 25 would take on so much meaning in the first century church as they're literally imprisoned, 
as people are literally hungry, as people are literally stripped of their clothes and belongings. You can imagine. And Jesus is saying, don't neglect my brethren. And people weren't thinking about it like they were doing it for God. They were just doing it because it was the right thing to do. And he said, blessed are you. Come on into my kingdom. On the other hand, it says literally on the other hand, then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer. He will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. It also uses that term there in the, the least of these. The least of these. It's somebody that isn't in the position that you're in. It's somebody that's in a, a worst position. It's the least of these. Maybe the people that are most marginalized in our culture. Maybe the people that are most at risk. We need to be considerate of. We need to be considerate of it. And of them. And then, of course, Jesus says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Try to every week get a little bit of hellfire and brimstone into these messages just to keep everybody thinking straight. Again, see, there's nobody here to laugh at my... It's not as much fun. It's just not as much fun. Verse 37, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, this is really interesting. This is really interesting because Jesus just told us to lend and, and to give and to expect nothing in return. But then he says, like, you know what? Also, this kind of relates to judgment and condemning people and so on. So, so don't do that or that's going to happen to you. And, and then he says, but what you give is going to be given back to you. Now, this is not some kind of prosperity verse. I'm not going to say, you know, mail in a check for $1,000 and you'll be sure to get that back and so on. No, the Bible teaches us that we're storing up treasures where? In heaven, right? To store up treasures in heaven, in fact, it says, well, don't store up treasures on the earth. Rather, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. And so that's the encouragement that we have in Scripture, and I believe he's talking about the spiritual blessings here. Again, the joy, the joy of the Lord that comes from helping people. If you understand that part of your purpose and the reason that God has created you is to act as a part of his body, to be used for his glory, and a large portion of that is serving others. It's serving others. It's meeting the needs of others. It's praying for people. It's, it's helping. It's being an encouragement. It's being a support. It's providing accountability. And sometimes it's meeting their needs. It's helping people physically in a tangible way. And Jesus says if you do that, it's going to be given back to you. It says good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. The other thing it brings up is judgmental. Are you a judgmental person? It's a good question. If you are, you probably didn't just say, yes, I am. Um, maybe you're not sure. If throughout this entire message, you have constantly been thinking of other people that maybe need to hear this message, then you're probably a judgmental person. 
because you're not taking any of this and actually applying it to yourself. You're just thinking about your coworker that should hear this or, or your brother or your sister or whoever that needs to hear this, and it's all just going completely over your head. That's really bad, okay? So I hope that's not the case. If it is, you know, hopefully the Holy Spirit just kind of poked you and said, wake up a little bit and start applying this to you because that's what you can actually control and that's what you're going to be accountable to God for is you and what you did or did not do for God. That's what Matthew 25 talks about. That's what Luke 6 is all about. What are you doing or not doing? Okay? And it's not the time to sit back and be the world critique organization. That doesn't exist, and it shouldn't. But some people act like they're members of it or something. Um, like, you know what now the time is to do? Let's, let's just sit back and, and judge how all the churches are responding to the coronavirus crisis. Yes, yes, yes. Let's just, let's just sit back. Oh, okay. And, and then if one church maybe... Um, decides, you know what, we're not going to have service. And another church decides, well, we're going to have service, but we're going to break it up. We're going to do it in smaller groups. And then another church decides um, that they're just, we don't care. We're not, you know, we're not afraid of anything, and we're just going to come in faith or something. And everybody decides, to do, you know what's easy to do? Just to sit back. Oh, I'll just be a keyboard warrior. I'll just, you know, I'll hide behind the computer and just criticize everything and just go, well, that's so dumb, and this is, you know, ridiculous, and these people are just responding in fear, and, and these people don't know what's good for them. They're going to be the ones infecting everybody else, and we can just sit back and judge and critique and condemn, and the reality is the person that's probably doing that probably isn't doing squat for God, and all these other people are. It's not the time for critiquing. We don't need any more of it. God, uh, I, I don't see in any of the listings of, of spiritual gifts to be an online critique of the church. So I'm sorry if I just crushed your dreams and you thought that that was your calling. <laughs> it's probably not. It's not one of the uh, positions that's mentioned in the church. But it is important to recognize the importance. And like I said earlier, pray for your church leaders. There's a lot of difficult decisions to make. And people are going to be critical no matter what you do. Somebody will have an opinion about something. And I'm just saying, as Christians, we need to be looking to support and encourage one another. How can I build somebody else up that's in the faith? So you're not going to hear me criticizing what, you know, other pastors or churches are doing in regard to this. Because I, I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they're going to do the best that they can uh, to minister to their people and to be pleasing to God. Because that's what it's all about. Just a couple more verses, you guys. And he spoke a parable to them. Verse 39. It says, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? This is such a crazy portion of Scripture. There's like... There's verses that all kinds of people know. People quote this stuff all the time. You know, do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. Um, judge not, and you or you will be judged. And, you know, can the blind lead the blind? These are, you know, people say that all the time, you know, jokingly about, about different situations, you know. Oh, the bl looks like the blind leading the blind over there. But can the blind lead the blind? This is Jesus said that. Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. This really hit me. One of the things I love about doing verse-by-verse -verse teaching is when you have to teach on these things, when you're doing expositional teaching and you're going verse-by-verse, -verse, you're confronted with verses that you normally wouldn't just pick and choose in a topical study. So it's one of the benefits of that. Blind leading the blind. Um, who are you following? Who are you listening to? And the contrast is some people are being led around by the hand. They're, they're, they're being discipled, if you will. They're following somebody else who is totally blind, in which case they're both doomed to stumble and fall. They're both going to suffer harm and damage is the idea that he's portraying and putting out there. It says a disciple 
is not, and it follows it up. It says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That's really, really interesting to me. It's interesting to think about it from a leadership perspective. It's very interesting to think about it from a following type of perspective. As who are the voices in your life that you are listening to? Who are you listening to? Where does your wisdom come from? Is it the wisdom of man or is it the wisdom of God? And the people that you're listening to in your life, who are they? Have you taken time to evaluate that recently? In Psalm chapter 1, it emphasizes the importance of this in the very first verse, in the very first chapter. And again, it's talking about being blessed. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The counsel of the ungodly. Whose counsel are you listening to? Who are you listening to? nor stands in the path of sinners. So it's discouraging us. Don't just go around listening to a bunch of ungodly people and how to respond to things. Don't just stand in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seats of the scornful. But his delight, this blessed person, this blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. This comes down to who you're listening to. And let me ask you this. Are you spending as much time in God's word as you are watching the news? Because I can tell you where you're going to get more wisdom and how to respond. I can tell you where you're going to get more comfort. I can tell you the place where God speaks and he speaks peace to his people. So who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? You want to be trained perfectly? You need to go to the real teacher. And be instructed by God and by his spirit. Be led by his spirit. Last two verses here. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. That's the word that it uses there. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. This section, again, is about evaluation. We've talked about judgmentalness. We've talked about evaluating ourselves. It's so easy for us to sit back and look at what anybody else is doing and to be critical of it. But the scripture calls us time and time again to first evaluate myself. And how do I evaluate myself? There's only one way to do it. I, in fact, I hate to call it a self-evaluation. I'd rather call it a God evaluation. Because it's a matter of allowing the word of God to be your evaluator. Let's not be too quick to judge others. Let's first always examine ourselves in the light of the word of God. And again, it gives us these indications. I asked earlier, are you judgmental? Are you a hypocrite? If when we talk about being a hypocrite and we talk about being judgmental and we talk about all these things, the only place you can go in your mind is thinking about other people you know, then, then you are. You are that person. Then you are that person. This is for us to evaluate ourselves. This is for you that, that's listening to this to say, am I this person that just sits back and, well, maybe I am. Maybe that's something I need to allow God to work on in my heart. Maybe that is my knee-jerk response, is to come with criticism, to come to, with condemnation instead of coming with encouragement and support and maybe accountability. That's something that really needs to be prayed about. You are accountable for you before God. 
First and foremost, the best thing that you can do for anybody in your life and anybody around you is to walk close with the Lord, to know God personally, to be in a living relationship with Him. That's the best thing you can do, husband, for your wife, parent, for your child, children, for your parents, brothers and sisters. It's the best thing you can do for your community. It, that's where it all starts. And, and all of your other relationships are going to benefit from that relationship with God. If you don't get that one right, you're going to have a really hard time getting any of the other ones right. It's probably not going to work out real well. And so if we're not willing to evaluate ourselves, if we're not willing to take a critical look in the mirror, that is God's word, then, then we're not going to have a good self-evaluation. We're going to spend our time tearing down others around us, and God's not going to get any glory through that. You're probably going to be pretty miserable most, most of the time and uh, not be that blessed man that the Scripture talks about. So I'll end with this because I love this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is living and powerful. The Word of God is alive. It, 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 God is moving in His Word. And it says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you might be saying, well, how do I evaluate myself, Pastor Aaron? How do I, how do I really do that? The Word of God, okay? You need to spend time in God's Word. You need, you need to look at it and allow it to be the evaluator. Allow God through his spirit, through his word. I always look at it like the Bible is our textbook from God. The Holy Spirit wrote the textbook and is also the teacher. Okay, He inspired the whole thing. And so now he comes in and God's spirit, we, we, we yield to his spirit. and We allow God to speak to us and to evaluate our lives. And it, and it says that it is a is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The very motivations, not just what you do, but why you do it. And the Word of God can point that out. And it says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account, our compassionate high priest. See, it can be a terrible thing to be honest with yourself and to be honest with God. It can be a terrifying thing. But it says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. How should we come? We come not not shrinking back in fear, not in terror. Oh, oh God's going to zap me if I want to get my life right. This is going to hurt so bad. This is going to be so painful. No, you should come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the solution. We know where to go. We know where to look. I'm going to invite the band to come back up and let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much that we can come right now boldly before you to obtain mercy and grace in a time of need. Lord, I want to lift up all of my brothers and sisters, Lord, that may be listening in to this. I want to pray for them. I want to pray that you meet them where, where they're at. Lord, we thank you that we serve a God who says we can cast all of our cares and anxieties on Christ. We want to thank you that we serve a God who is a refuge to us. Who is a source of strength in time of need. And I pray, Lord God, by your spirit, by your grace, that you would make us more sensitive to the needs of others that are around us. That you help us to rightly evaluate our lives in light of your word. And that as we look at your word in our private time, Lord, that we would make the most of this season and the most of this time. And, and, and as we come to you in our it, whether it's in the prayer closet or in our morning Bible reading or evening or, or wherever we find the time to do it, God, that you would speak to us and that you would point out the things in our lives that, that need to go, the things we need to work on, and that you would empower us by your Spirit to live as a new kind of people here on this earth. 
and that you continue to change the culture to shape this nation. We do pray that you be with our nation's leaders, uh, that you give them wisdom, that you protect them, Father God, and that you lead them in the right direction. And I pray for your protection over your people as well. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Have an awesome week. God bless.